Welcome everyone to our webinar on colorectal cancer screening and prevention. Thank you for taking the time to join us in a conversation about a topic that is highly important, but oftentimes is difficult to uh, embark on with your family members or with friends, etc. So we want to be able to take today's time to share some information from you from our colleagues and experts here at Mayo Clinic. Um, we have a team that can support and can field questions as we go along during the webinar. Um, and also be able to uh, take your questions uh, uh, at any time and answer, respond as best we can to the concerns that are um, of highest priority to you. I do want to acknowledge that uh, March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. Um, if you see on the title slide for the webinar today, um, there is a symbol of a blue star. The blue star symbol is meant to um, represent hope and healing for patients who are diagnosed with colorectal cancer. There is also uh, a logo for a new initiative being sponsored by the American Cancer Society called 80% by 2018. This is an initiative, a national initiative that we're trying to uh, do our part to increase colorectal cancer screening rates beyond where they are today, as we'll talk about uh, during the presentation. The presentation will cover um, maybe 25 or 30 minutes or so of the time that we have together, and then we will turn it over to uh, a question and answer session. So again, my name is Paul Lindbergh. I'm the medical director for Mayo Clinic's Office of Wellness. I'm a practicing gastroenterologist, and my specialty is in colorectal and other GI cancer prevention. Just to give a little bit of disclosure information, the topics that I'll cover are based on uh, information that is widely accessible, but I do have research uh, support from uh, several industry partners and also uh, have worked with a company called Exact Sciences uh, through a royalty sharing agreement. <clears throat> so we're coming to you live from Rochester, Minnesota. Rochester, Minnesota is the home of many things, including the Mayo Brothers. Uh, we celebrated our 150th anniversary at Mayo Clinic last year. Um, we have a long tradition in medical care and medical excellence. Um, a picture of Rochester on the right, but what some of you may or may not know is that we're also the home of the world's only giant polyp sculpture. This was a uh, uh, representation of a polyp that was created by a Minnesota artist back in 2008 as a creative way for us to get the word out about colorectal cancer screening. So we're always trying to find new innovative ways to talk about colon cancer screening but because it is highly preventable. Just as uh, a brief overview for the, the time that we'll have during the presentation, uh, we'll cover a general background, what is colorectal cancer, talk through some of the screening options and expert guidelines, and let me forewarn you that there are multiple screening options and a lack of uniform consensus by even the experts who spend a lot of time thinking about colon cancer screening. Uh, we'll think through some of the modifiable risk and protective factors. What are those lifestyle changes or even dietary changes that you might be able to make uh, to try to reduce your risk for colorectal cancer and then summarize. So let's dive right in. What is colorectal cancer? The figure on the slide depicts the uh, large and small intestine. So the large intestine consists of the colon and the rectum. The colon and the rectum together are the colorectum and cancers that form in any part along that colorectal uh, intestinal tract are termed colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancers can look uh, um, different both at what we would say is a macroscopic level, which is a high level, um, what we might see visually when we do a, a, a procedure to look for colon and rectal cancer. They also can look different under the microscope. There are three pictures of colon cancers or colorectal cancers on this slide. The one that is on the leftmost image or the center image uh, in a kind of a reddish appearance is an adenocarcinoma. This is 95% of all colorectal cancers are a histologic type called adenocarcinoma. But there are other cancers that can happen in this body part. So on the top uh, right hand side is a melanoma. Melanomas happen on the skin, but they can also spread to the colon and rectum and technically be classified as colorectal uh, cancers. Down in the lower right image is a picture of a carcinoid tumor. Carcinoid tumors are also very common. Um, they're not as common as adenocarcinomas in the colon and rectum, but that may be another finding that somebody that undergoes a colonoscopy, for example, may be diagnosed with following the procedure. How common is colorectal cancer? Well, approximately one in every 18 people over the course of a lifetime are diagnosed with this disease. So it's a very common disease. Matter of fact, it ranks second if you put men and women together with respect to both colon, uh, excuse me, cancer incidence and mortality in the United States. 
So one common misperception that's out there is that colon cancer is rare and also that it only affects a certain demographic, meaning primarily men. That's not true. It affects men and women alike, about one in 18 people over the course of a lifetime. These are some um, graphs that show uh, how common colon cancer incidence and colon cancer mortality, uh, meaning dying from colon cancer, are after uh, as people progress in age. So if you look, the curves are relatively flat up to about age 40, and then they start to gradually rise and rise more steeply after age 50. The reason to share this information is, again, the rates increase for both men and women in a similar way, and also starting at about age 50, where we would recommend screening, as we'll talk about going through some of the screening guidelines. Well, in terms of uh, who's at risk for colon cancer, how can you identify somebody? How can you um, stratify your own risk for colorectal cancers? If you look at this pie chart, the biggest segment is in the blue, and that's about 75% of all people diagnosed with colorectal cancer are what we would term as average risk, meaning that we don't know of any risk factors other than age for that individual who is eventually diagnosed with colon or rectal cancer. There are some conditions that we're very familiar with that can increase risk for colon cancer or rectal cancer, and that factors into some of the management guidelines that your physicians uh, may talk with you about. So family history not otherwise specified, that just means uh, a first degree relative or even a second degree relative with colorectal cancer or multiple family members can increase your risk by about 15% compared to the general population. That, excuse me, by about, by about twofold compared to the general population. And that um, classification comprises about 15% of all colorectal cancer cases. HNPCC, or another uh, term for that syndrome, is called Lynch syndrome. This is familial kindreds where there are colon cancers, can be uterine cancers, can be other cancers that run through generations. That is a, a situation where there are special guidelines. Similar to what's called FAP, or familial adenomatous polyposis, another heritable cancer syndrome, where at a genetic level, individuals are at increased risk for colorectal cancers and even other cancers. Those are relatively small percentages of all colorectal cancer cases, maybe somewhere on the order of about 5%. There are even less common familial syndromes that are uh, fewer than one in 100 colorectal cancer cases. The last um, category on this slide, inflammatory bowel disease. Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, or other names for inflammatory bowel disease, and about 3% of all colorectal cancer cases arise in patients who have those conditions. So I mentioned at the outset that there is a, a lack of complete consensus among experts. And this slide just demonstrates that. It's kind of a busy slide, but if you look at, there's at least five different sets of guidelines that have been published since 2008 by major uh, uh, clinical societies, GI societies, radiology societies, et cetera. And I'll just walk through a few different uh, features on this slide. So over on the left-hand column are the different test options. And if you look, there are seven different test options that would be considered as endorsed or appropriate, at least by some organization for colorectal cancer screening. Compare that to breast cancer screening, where the, the vast majority of experts recommend mammography um, as the initial test or sometimes even the only test for breast cancer screening. So seven different options for colorectal cancer screening. If you follow the slide uh, to the right, you can see that the interval varies depending on which test is chosen. And there's also um, differences of opinion or differences of endorsement by these different organizations to say whether or not a specific option is endorsed by that group or acceptable to that group or not. So we'll walk through each of these different options here to get a little bit uh, better feel for what the tests are. Just to summarize this slide and to summarize maybe even the, the um, message to take home from colorectal cancer screening, there is no single best colorectal cancer screening option for everyone. The best colon cancer screening test is the one that gets done and is right for you and your clinician. So let's look at risk stratification in maybe a slightly simpler way. Um, CRN on this slide is colorectal neoplasia. That refers to people who have had a personal history of colon polyps or colon cancer. Um, those individuals are in a higher risk category. They're technically not eligible for colon cancer screening any longer. They would be put in a surveillance program, so not average risk. IBD is that 3% of all colorectal cancer cases, inflammatory bowel disease, 
if somebody has had Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis that's affected them extensively, uh, there are some groups anyway that would suggest screening after eight years uh, for colon cancer, eight years after inflammatory bowel disease diagnosis. For family history, I talked a little bit about heritable syndromes and also an absence of a heritable syndrome, that familial NOS category. Both of those situations would um, uh, suggest that screening should be done at an earlier age, sometimes even in early adulthood or at age 40 years, depending on exactly what the family history looks like. Where we're going to spend the majority of the time this afternoon is on the population that doesn't have the, any risk factors. That's 75% of the pie chart who are classified as average risk. For that population, screening should begin at 50 years, and there are multiple options for screening. What are we looking for when we, as clinicians, uh, do a colon cancer screening test? We're looking for the precancerous lesions. So this is an adenomatous polyp, sometimes called an adenoma. By taking out these adenomatous polyps, which can be done through a test like a colonoscopy, we've removed the possibility for cancer to form in that specific uh, lesion or area. However, individuals can be at risk for future polyps or future adenomas, and that's why we would say we would recommend surveillance after a polyp has been identified at a screening exam. Just in terms of size of lesions, um, the risk for what's called high-grade dysplasia, which again is a precancerous finding under the microscope, but high-grade dysplasia is sort of the next-door neighbor to cancer, or colorectal cancer itself, each of those conditions uh, increases with the size of the polyp or size of the lesion that's identified. So if you look in millimeters on this chart for very small lesions, anything less than 10 millimeters in size, the chance that there's high-grade dysplasia there or colon cancer already there is extremely small. We tend to take those uh, polyps or lesions out at the time of a colonoscopy if it's technically um, safe and easy to do so, just so that they don't ever grow into these larger size lesions. Over on the right-hand side of this graph, if you see a greater than 30 millimeter or three centimeter uh, lesion or neoplasm would have almost a 50% chance of having high-grade dysplasia or a 50% chance of having colorectal cancer. So clearly finding polyps earlier, they're easier to take care of and there's less chance that they may already have colorectal cancer uh, within the polyp. So this slide just shows that screening works. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about colon cancer screening because we think with um, uh, uh, more aggressive colorectal cancer screening efforts, we may be able to, to uh, eliminate even 90% of all cholor colorectal cancer cases. Showing a slide here from a timeline 1975 all the way out to 2011, looking at new cases in green, uh, deaths in darker green, and then five-year survival at the, at the bottom hand of the slide, you can see that the number of new cases of colon and rectal cancer continues to decline the deaths from colorectal cancer continue to decline. The five-year relative survival, meaning how long does somebody survive after a diagnosis of colon and rectal cancer, continues to increase. So all of these are positive figures. All of these um, uh, numbers or this, these data can be attributable, at least in part, to colorectal cancer screening and more wide use of colorectal cancer screening. So let's talk about some of the specific tests. guiac based FOBTs or fecal occult blood tests. These tests have been around for a long time. People have been using these tests in some way, shape, or form for over 100 years. Not for colon cancer screening, but to try to detect blood in the stool, which can come from hemorrhoids, can come from things other than colon polyps or cancers. These guiac based FOBTs typically require um, smearing two to three samples of, uh, of stool onto a card, and then that card is either hand-delivered or mailed in for processing and interpretation. Those who have had a guaiac-based uh, fecal occult blood test, there are some diet and medication restrictions that you need to be aware of. Those vary by test, and the instruction kits clearly specify what you should avoid prior to doing one of these uh, evaluations. The nice thing about guaiac based FOBTs are they are the first test that was ever shown to be associated with actual decrease in colorectal cancer mortality among a screened population. There were three large studies, subsequently three more studies, that looked in a randomized way at um, comparing individuals who did not have colon cancer screening with an FOBT versus those that did. If you look um, every two years in the yellow graphs and every year 
yearly FOBT in the orange uh, chart in the Minnesota trial, the rates of colorectal cancer mortality declined. So about a 30% reduction uh, in colorectal cancer mortality associated with regular screening by GWIAC-based FOBTs. <clears throat> so why isn't that the only screening test that we would recommend? There are some challenges with the test. It's a good test, but there's a high miss rate. So sometimes polyps, I mentioned polyps or adenomas are the precursor lesion. That's what we're actually looking for to prevent colon cancer, may not be detected with guaiac-based FOBTs. There's also a frequent false positive rate. Over on the right-hand side of the slide, for every 100 positive guaiac-based FOBT results, only two of those individuals would actually have colon cancer and only four additional would have colorectal adenomas. So there's a high rate of false positives which result in uh, subsequent colonoscopy or other diagnostic testing which that individual may not have needed. Fecal immunochemical tests, this is another stool-based test. This one is a little bit different in terms of how the test um, is designed. So this detects a blood-derived protein rather than just an enzyme in the in the stool, which is the guaiac-based FOBT. So with these FIT tests, the blood-derived protein is globin. So this actually detects the protein that is the backbone of a, a blood drop in the stool. Um, a single sample is acceptable with these tests. Sometimes having more uh, samples collected improves the accuracy of the test. Diet and medications have less of an influence when you're doing a FIT test compared to a guaiac-based FOBT test. And these tests are superior to the older generation of uh, blood-based stool testing. So if you look in a, uh, a study that was reported about three years ago, 10,000 individuals thereabouts participated. Um, some were uh, assigned to the GWIAC-based FOBT, some assigned to the FIT arm. If you look at the advanced colorectal neoplasia uh, section and you look at the detection rate, many more individuals with advanced precancerous or even cancerous lesions were detected by the FIT test, uh, nearly three times as many with the FIT test compared to the guaiac-based FOBT. So we think that FIT tests probably perform better than guaiac-based FOBTs for, with respect to colorectal cancer screening. There's one even newer um, category of stool tests, and those are stool DNA tests, which have received lots of attention over the recent past. Stool DNA tests um, don't measure blood exclusively, some of the tests like Cologuard, which has been FDA approved, measure blood in addition to some other DNA-based markers. Why is that important? Well, the DNA-based markers are actually shed directly by the tumor or the, the cancer or the polyp. And it gives a little bit better uh, ability or even a much better <laughs> ability to detect something like a polyp or a cancer as opposed to a, another bleeding situation in the colon that may have nothing to, to do with colorectal cancer risk. Um, with the stool DNA tests, at least with Cologuard, which is depicted in this um, uh, image on the slide, a larger sample is needed. Um, there are some special collection uh, instructions and components of a collection kit, which can be mailed to your home after a prescription from your physician to arrange for Cologuard screening, for example. And these tests work. So Cologuard, uh, there was a large study that was conducted by colleagues here at Mayo Clinic and elsewhere, um, published in a, a journal called New England Journal of Medicine last year. This was a multi-center large study and Cologuard detected 92% overall of colorectal cancers that occurred in this study population. Even more impressively for those early stage, stage one and two colorectal cancers, which are more treatable, more curable, the, um, the sensitivity rate or the detection rate went up to 94% compared to 70% for those FIT tests for that the blood-based test that's derived uh, or based on measuring a, a, a blood protein. So stool-based DNA tests performing better uh, than FIT tests in a large uh, multi-center study. And this test is now um, also being uh, used in, in some instances. Um, you can find uh, adenomas with the Cologuard test uh, uh, in this same study. Um, the Cologuard detected advanced adenomas uh, at a higher rate than, than the FIT test, and this test is now approved by the FDA and covered by many organizations for colorectal cancer screening. Um, to talk about some of the non-stool-based uh, colorectal cancer screening options, flexible sigmoidoscopy is an endoscopy-based uh, way of screening for colon polyps and cancers. 
Uh, flexible sigmoid oscopy involves visual inspection of the distal part of the colon and rectum, the lower 50 to 60 centimeters uh, with an endoscope. Usually this test is performed unsedated. It takes about five minutes to perform. Uh, nurses can perform flexible sigmoid oscopies if they're appropriately credentialed, to, so it doesn't require a physician. Polyps are typically not removed because the preparation is uh, uh, less on a flexible sigmoid oscopy than it is with a colonoscopy. In a test, uh, in a study called the PLCO prostate, lung, colon, ovarian cancer screening trial, um, flexible sigmoid oscopy resulted in 29% and 14% risk reductions for distal and proximal colorectal cancers, tumors located in specific parts of the colon, respectively. The graph on the slide just shows that um, with any screening approach, including flexible sigmoidoscopy, you may find cancers that have been there uh, at the time of a screening exam. We want to find those cancers at their earliest possible stage, but sometimes even in a screening program, the cancer detection rates go up until you clear out those individuals who already entered into the program with cancers at that time. Then following uh, forward uh, over many years, you can show that flexible sigmoidoscopy does reduce the number of newly diagnosed colon cancers compared to individuals who did not undergo that test option. Colonoscopy is the other endoscopy-based colorectal cancer screening option. This is a more uh, intensive test. If you look at the diagram on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the blue colonoscope reaching all the way to the uh, upper part of the colon called the cecum. So the entire colorectum can be visualized at the time of colonoscopy. Polyps can actually be removed during the screening exam if they're found because um, as anyone who's had a colonoscopy knows, the preparation prior to colonoscopy is quite intensive. Um, the complication rate for colonoscopy is about one in a thousand for things like bleeding or even a perforation that can occur when the exam is performed or if polyps are taken out but the test also works. So colorectal cancer incidence is thought to be uh, reduced, the number of new cases reduced by about 75%, the number of colorectal cancer deaths reduced by about 50% by individuals who have undergone colonoscopy with polyp removal compared to individuals who have not availed themselves of that screening test. There are some things to consider um, if you are talking with your clinician about uh, colonoscopy for colorectal cancer screening. Up at the top uh, image on the slide, withdrawal time. You want to make sure we as gastroenterologists or as clinicians need to make sure that we spend enough time looking for polyps, looking for cancers as the colonoscope is withdrawn. Um, on the middle image there with the red and the green, there are some areas where the colonoscope um, may or may not see very well unless the individual performing the, the exam does a careful inspection. So looking behind folds in the colon, making sure that every um, um, part of the colon is, is well visualized at the time of the examination is highly important. And on the lower right hand uh, figure, there is a new, uh, a, a more recently recognized subtype of polyps called sessile polyps or sessile serrated polyps, sessile serrated adenomas, which have precancerous potential, and they tend to be flat and a little bit more difficult to visualize at the time of uh, screening examination. So all of those things are um, uh, very apparent to uh, colonoscopists, but you wanna make sure if you have colonoscopy screening that you have a clinician and a, a, a colon colonoscopist who um, has experience with the procedure. CT colonography is probably the radiology tool that is most often used, and it um, really is just a fraction of individuals uh, who use this for their colon cancer screening uh, at the present time. CT colonography is sometimes called virtual colonoscopy. It's a minimally invasive test. It does require that there's a rectal catheter inserted to insufflate or to expand the colon and rectum during the exam. It does require a prep similar to colonoscopy, and the complication rate is lower, but still not zero, about three in 10,000 uh, for complications that require medical attention after a CT colonography. In a large trial, again, conducted at Mayo Clinic and other sites, um, <clears throat> there was uh, uh, data that showed that CT colono colonography is comparable to optical colonoscopy or standard colonoscopy with respect to finding 
lesions that are of most interest, meaning polyps a centimeter or greater in size. So CT colonography is an acceptable test endorsed by many organizations, and if somebody does not choose any of the other screening options, CT colonography can, can play a, a, a valuable role. It is a test that has not been uh, uh, endorsed or covered by all insurance companies um, due to the available evidence, at least as of 2009, and then um, some smaller studies that have been published since that time. So still a test that's available, still a test that's covered by some insurance providers, but not by every insurance provider. This is a test where older individuals, if they um, have conditions that would make colonoscopy um, potentially more risky or, or increase the complication rate at colonoscopy, sometimes CT colonography can be uh, a tool that the clinicians might choose uh, based on age and, and associated other medical conditions. Just to show that there are some interesting things and there's always innovation going on with all of these tests, CT colonography um, can actually uh, look at an unprepped colon and still identify a polyp, which is shown in the lower right corner of the left-hand image there. So if we can get a, a better prep or better yet, even eliminate the prep prior to a screening exam, um, that would be much more tolerable for many patients and there's active work actively being done uh, to look at that. On the video clip that's being shown right now, there's also a way to separate out debris in the colon from vascular lesions that arise from the colon surface. So this is a polyp that has blood vessels in it and with computer-aided uh, technologies you can identify um, those areas and, and uh, confidently ca categorize them as polyps or um, areas that need to be further pursued based on their blood supply. So what else can we do beyond screening? Well, there are some things where we understand modifiable and potentially even protective factors, and I just wanted to talk about three in specific. One, smoking, the second, body size, and the third, uh, use of aspirin. So cigarette smoking, about 20% of the population still smokes despite our best efforts. Um, figures as low as 16% have been recently reported, but still have a, a little ways to go before uh, smoking is, is uh, diminished to a level where we don't see the adverse health consequences. On the graph on this slide, it's even maybe more alarming to show that high school students tend to use uh, cigarettes or at least try cigarettes, and oftentimes that's when they may become addicted. So um, somewhere around 50% of the population in high school um, may still be trying cigarettes, hopefully not continuing with that habit. The association between colorectal cancer and cigarette smoking has been controversial. As recently as 2009, um, an agency reported that there was not a convincing link, but I think the data that have come out since then would show otherwise. This is a, a little bit of a challenging slide to read. Um, these are what are called meta-analysis graphs, and these meta-analyses take findings from multiple different research studies that have been reported. They take the results, they put them together, and come up with uh, sort of a, a compilation or a summary score for, for the findings from all of those different trials. If you look at the data from uh, studies that have looked at the association between uh, smoking and colon cancer, there's about a 15 to 30 percent increase in colorectal cancer risk in smokers compared to never smokers. Um, what's called the attributable fraction, meaning how many colorectal cancers may have a link to smoking, it could be as high as one in five colon cancer cases. So I think compelling evidence to support that cigarette smoking can be linked to increased risk for colorectal cancer, as well as many other health complications. For body size, um, just some um, health consequences that we're all familiar with related to increased body size, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, but also cancers. And the rates of uh, overweight or obesity are increasing at a striking rate both in the United States and in many other regions of the world. If you look in 2000 at the map of the United States, you can see that the body weight categories or the obesity prevalence was much lower. There's very few states that move beyond the blue and the tan. If you look down in 2010, the rates of obesity climbing upwards of 30% in the dark orange, you, there's almost no blue left on the, the map of the United States, meaning that um, in almost every state, the, the rate of obesity is at least 20% and in some cases even higher than 30%. So busy slide here summarizing another meta-analysis. 
um, the relative risk for colorectal cancer in obese individuals in this meta-analysis was 1.33. That translates to a 33% increase in colorectal cancer risk for somebody whose BMI was over 30. So body size and colorectal cancer, uh, I think, again, a, a, a compelling association. The mechanisms may be linked to something called metabolic syndrome, which you may hear from um, popular press or even from your clinicians. Um, trying to reduce your risk for metabolic syndrome may also reduce your risk for colorectal cancer. And just lastly, in terms of specifics, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, these could be protective or reduce your risk for colorectal cancer. The jury is still out, but about 40% of U.S. adults use aspirin, which is one non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, on a regular basis. Matter of fact, the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs may offset some of the risk from being um, obese. If you look at meta-analysis data from um, those who use non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs compared to those who don't, you can see the relative risk here is below one. This translates into a 27% risk reduction in colorectal cancer risk for those who use these, these um, aspirin or other drugs compared to individuals who don't use NSAIDs. Um, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force has weighed in. These drugs, even aspirin, are safe, but they're not entirely safe when you talk about potentially millions of individuals taking them to prevent colorectal cancer. And on a strict population level, if everyone went on aspirin or another non just to prevent colorectal cancer, probably the complications like GI bleeding or sometimes even strokes might outweigh the benefits uh, in terms of numbers of colon cancers that were prevented. So talk to your clinician about whether or not taking an aspirin or another anti-inflammatory drug is right for you. And just in the last couple of minutes, um, it's important to recognize that as uh, clinicians and scientists, we're understanding that colorectal cancers, even adenomatous uh, uh, lesions or adenocarcinomas can come in different varieties. So the pictures shown on this slide are all adenocarcinomas, but they don't look the same. They don't look the same with respect to their um, biologic basis either, or their genetic mutations or their epigenetic uh, profiles. So we think that colorectal cancer subtypes might have some connection to their different types of risk factors. Um, our group here at Mayo Clinic is actively exploring whether things like cigarette smoking or alcohol intake or even pr potentially protective medications like uh, estrogen-based compounds may have different implications for risk for those colorectal cancer subtypes. One other area that um, is showing some promise but is moving slowly is called cancer chemo prevention. This is the um, idea that taking a pill or taking a supplement might reduce your risk for colorectal cancer. Uh, we have a large clinical trial network called the Cancer Prevention Network that's distributed across the United States, Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, um, where we're exploring some of these uh, drugs and supplements to see if they have an effect on even earlier lesions prior to adenoma formation, something called aberrant crypt foci, which can be detected at the time of endoscopy, whether or not those um, predict risk for colorectal cancer, whether we can modify that risk with drugs or supplements remains to be seen. So what's our current perspective? Um, it's almost baseball season, spring training is happening. So the glass is either half empty or half full if you're a Red Sox fan or a Twins fan, I'll say. But what, what is our summary perspective on colorectal cancer? And I think it's on this slide. So the large majority of new and fatal colorectal cancers can be prevented with regular screening. I think the existing screening options are effective, but they're underutilized. We need to get to that 80% mark by 2018. We're trying to get there as quickly as we can. New screening technologies will probably complement rather than replace the currently endorsed tools like colonoscopy. There's a role for all of the different test options. Find the one that's right for you and your clinician. There are other things that you can do to reduce your risk for colorectal cancer. Um, avoiding things that are potentially harmful, like smoking and increased body size. Maybe considering things that might be helpful after talking with your clinician, like taking an aspirin if it's right for you. Um, and more information hopefully will come out from chemo prevention trials over the coming years. Early detection is always key. Finding colon polyps, even colon cancers earlier, increases the rate for uh, prevention and even for cure. And Mayo Clinic is helping to lead the way. So I think we have some time left. Be happy to answer your questions as best we're able to. 
Um, and thank you for your attention. A quick minute while we pull up some of the questions here. Um, the first question, and some of these questions I think we'll, I'll try to um, rephrase in general terms. Um, it's, it's important that any specific information, uh, medical guidance is, is provided by your clinicians. So please take this as uh, hopefully useful information, but feel free to share it and make sure you share it with your care team. So one question that came in talked about a five millimeter sessile polyp. That's a kind of a flat polyp, refers to the shape of the polyp. A five millimeter sessile polyp identified and removed at the time of presumably a screening colonoscopy. This individual under age 40, when should the next colonoscopy be performed? Well, if this lesion was found in an average risk population over age 50, the guidance would be to repeat the exam in about five to 10 years. So five years is an acceptable interval. The fact that um, this person was screened under age 40 brings in some question about family history. So depending on exactly what that family history situation looks like, five years might be the right interval. Sometimes we would even uh, do a surveillance examination at a, uh, an earlier time point if there are multiple young family members with colon polyps, colon cancers, uh, for example. Another question relates to polyps. How are polyps formed? That's a fantastic question. We don't know the full answer. I mentioned a couple of risk factors for polyps, smoking, increased body size. Um, we don't know exactly what that trigger is that causes a polyp to start from a normal colon and, and rectal uh, 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 lining surface cell. So we're, we're still trying to understand that. With respect to genetics, I think that we've, we've gotten um, really a lot smarter over the last many years to even decades in terms of what are those DNA mutations or genetic um, uh, associations with polyps and cancers, and there are some gene targets that are now even be, being applied to some of the therapies that we would use for colon cancers. There's another area of research that I think is really exciting, and that's called epigenetics. Um, epigenetics refers to not the actual DNA backbone, but some of the different um, um, molecular tags that sit on top of that DNA backbone and how that can um, affect the genes that are expressed, the proteins that the body makes, and how that translates into risk for different conditions like colorectal cancer. So epigenetics is an area that's really, uh, I think, becoming more and more important in the cancer conversation. Um, there probably will be implications for prevention with respect to both genetics and epigenetics, but we're not quite there yet. If somebody develops polyps, um, will they if those polyps are taken out, will they ever turn into cancer? No. When, once those polyps are removed, the, the risk for cancer is gone from that specific spot or that specific lesion once they're completely removed. But that individual is still at risk for future polyps, which is why we need to make sure that somebody who has had a polyp comes uh, in for regular examinations, surveillance examinations. Another question about family history, uh, a patient or a person whose mother died of colon cancer at age 81. Um, an older brother and the individual are in their 80s and 70s respectively and are having colonoscopies about every two years. Each time polyps are seen and removed during colonoscopy, uh, the question relates to is a two-year cycle for colonoscopies the right one? I, I would say that, again, that it's, it's not a question where you can turn to a page in a textbook or a guideline and say this is what works for everybody. The fact that there are polyps identified at each colonoscopy um, makes me think that for whatever reason, polyps are forming a little bit more quickly in this family than they might be in some other families. So a two yearly interval certainly seems reasonable as long as those exams are tolerated, as long as um, overall health status is, is uh, good enough to withstand a colonoscopy and, and anything that might result from a colonoscopy. So a, a need, need to individualize the surveillance interval based on discussions with your own uh, care team. Another question related to family history, a 40-year-old aunt just died from metastatic colorectal cancer. That's a younger age than we typically would see individuals diagnosed with colon cancer, particularly metastatic or colon cancers that have spread. Um, similar family history with uh, respect to the individual asking the question has a, a pattern of digestive health and immune system issues or symptoms similar to the aunt who um, has died from metastatic colorectal cancer. And the specific question is, how young is too young to use the Cologuard product to pre-screen? Well, there's an important point here. Cologuard is approved for average risk screening. If you go to the Cologuard test website, 
um, you'll, you'll be able to find the information about when to use uh, the test, at least based on the approvals that are out there. For this situation, this would not be considered an average risk family. So the Cologuard product would not have been approved for this indication. Talk with your care team, find out which of the available uh, options to identify polyps or cancers at an early stage might be right for you. But this is a family history that should call attention and should call the question of colorectal cancer screening um, uh, for that individual with their physician or, or other caregiver. Um, another question, somebody has uh, already scheduled their colorectal cancer screening for next month. Congratulations, uh, thanks for taking that step. What are the alternative types of testing um, that could be used? I'll just tick through those again at the beginning of the conversation. We talked about those. There are several different stool test options. There are two endoscopy-based options, flexible sigmoidoscopy and colonoscopy. There's really only one radiology option now, CT colonography. A test called double contrast barium enema is really not widely utilized anymore. That was a test that we had used in the past, but most radiologists don't even get trained to perform barium enemas anymore, at least not with high frequency. So multiple different test options, find the one that works for you. Who's at higher risk of having a gastric type cancer? Um, this is an interesting question. I'm not sure if a gastric type cancer refers to a different uh, appearance under the microscope for some of the cells that can be found in, in different cancer types, or maybe I'll try to answer the question as, if you have colon cancer, are you at risk for gastric cancer, which refers to stomach cancer? Um, the short answer is in most individuals, we aren't aware of a link between colon cancer and stomach cancer, but in some families where there are those heritable cancer syndromes, Lynch syndrome, for example, there can be a connection between colon cancer and gastric or stomach cancer. So make sure if that's a pattern that um, you've identified in your family that you speak uh, with uh, somebody who's familiar with Lynch syndrome to find out what you can do to reduce your risk. Another question talking about tubular adenomas found on an EGD test. So EGD is a esophageal gastroduodenoscopy. This is a test that looks for lesions in the upper part of the intestine. So esophagus, stomach, first part of the small intestine. This individual had a tubular adenoma, which is a polyp. Um, in the colon, tubular adenomas have precancerous uh, pre potential. They likely do in the upper part of the intestinal tract too, but it may be different than it is in the lower part. Um, what is the outlook for recurrent tubular adenomas in somebody who's had one of these diagnosed in their upper tract and how often should surveillance be done? There are some factors that go into that recommendation. Family history, as I've already stressed, need to understand what your family cancer risks are and whether or not there's any indication of a heritable syndrome. For tubular adenomas that are found, quote, sporadically, meaning without a family history of a heritable syndrome, important features would be the size of the lesion. Um, the degree of dysplasia, if it's low grade or high grade, and how many uh, uh, adenomas are found. So with that information, I think um, your physician can give you a, a better recommendation about should you come back on a yearly basis or can the interval be extended uh, even beyond that. Um, if the polyp was completely removed or not completely removed, there may be even a, a, a recommendation to pursue a follow-up exam at a, a sooner time point question about race and ethnicity and how that affects colon cancer risk or colorectal cancer risk. There are some differences by uh, race ethnicity. African Americans tend to have a higher risk for colorectal cancer for many other uh, cancers and they tend to develop them at a slightly younger age. So there are at least some organizations that have suggested screening African Americans for colorectal cancer starting at age 45 years in the absence of other risk factors. Interestingly, Asian Pacific Islanders, Hispanics uh, also have lower risk for colorectal cancer compared to the general uh, Caucasian population. So far anyway, those have not uh, factored into specific guidelines, but um, uh, there at least at a biologic level may be some differences with respect to um, some of the some of the different uh, racial and ethnic patterns that we're seeing with colorectal cancer. Question talks about being diagnosed with SPS. Uh, now have 20 flat polyps removed. Do you need to remove the colon in these cases? Cases. So I think SPS referring to serrated polyposis syndrome. 
This is another uh, probably heritable syndrome. Um, we don't understand all the details at a genetic level with SPS just yet, but these flat lesions that have a different appearance under the microscope uh, than some of the standard pre or other precancerous lesions that we see. It's certainly reasonable to think about having a colon resection to remove um, the risk for future colon cancers in high risk situations. Um, again, I think that that's a decision that's highly personalized, depends on age, depends on um, other health conditions you might have, depends on ability to remove polyps at the time of a colonoscopy. So certainly worth a discussion, certainly would be something to consider, but it's not the only option for cancer prevention, even in SPS. What can be given to prevent nausea and vomiting in the preparation leading up to colonoscopy? Um, the nausea and the vomiting is not uh, specific to the preparation agents that are most commonly used. It's really uh, a, an individual's reaction to having to take the PrEP more often than not, so it's not an allergy, for example. Um, if there's a PrEP that doesn't work for you, there are multiple different kinds of PrEP uh, for colonoscopy. Find the one that works for you. There are some things with some of these um, go lightly preps or the movie preps or the polyethylene glycol based preps that can help um, keeping the preparation chilled while you're taking it seems to help drinking it in smaller volumes more frequently seems to help ask your pharmacist ask your physician if there are other tips that they can give you to try to make the preparation uh, as pleasant as possible I think we're close to the end of our time. We're at the end of our list of questions. Thank you for your participation today. Um, if there are other questions that uh, people want to submit, be happy to try to answer those as best we can offline and get that information back to you. But just to, to say one more time, colorectal cancers are highly preventable. Screening and other preventive options work. Find the choice that works best for you, and thank you for your time.